big asker. I ask God all the time <laughs> for things, but um, if I was asking for me, for my pay or or my child or something, it yeah, it would stop me. But I'm asking for the people that I serve and that we serve at South Niagara Life Ministry. Some of you are aware of what we do, some of you are not. Uh, this week, <coughs> I had the privilege of meeting with different people in different uh, venues uh, for work and for ministry, really. And some of the comments I had were, um, I want peace. Yes. So after expressing all kinds of things and letting out all kinds of things, like many of us do, the final statement was, I want peace. Another person said, is there hope? Yeah, <laughs> I can't do that, but you know, inside I was doing that. Um, and I asked someone if they knew about Jesus, and they had no idea who he was or what he had done. But they said, tell me, you know, I'll do anything right now. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, that's what I want to hear, right? Um, we've also, in the last month, had five salvations. Uh, just in under a month. And so, you can understand how we're incredibly excited. It's more than just dramatics. <laughs> Late and standardized cat or whatever. We are completely excited about what God is doing. Not just in our ministry, but here in Fort Erie, in the Niagara region, on campus. God's spirit is moving and doing only what he can. So we would love for you to come and celebrate with us. But it is a fun day. So we want you to know you can come, you can enjoy the meal for free. Sponsors have uh, donated money to cover that cost, and anything given that night will go directly to our services. And people who can't afford counsel uh, can come and receive the hope and the salvation and the renewal and redemption and healing and on it goes uh, because people like yourselves give, and we really, really appreciate your support. Uh, up until this point, and again uh, at our banquet. So I didn't realize we would be doing all of it. Have I covered everything? <laughs> <laughs> we need 150 confirmed people by the 20th, or it gets canceled, and we're still a little bit short of that number. So if you can possibly come, please do. 27th of October. I just want to reiterate something. We don't do the easy stuff. We do the hard stuff through Jesus in his name, not to our glory, not to our credit, but for his. Like Jody said, five salvations in the last month. The money you give to us is useful and purposeful and impacts the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So please, I just want to encourage you, take this seriously. It's not something like, oh, you know, it is going to be a good time. I was going to say it's, it's not about having a good time. It is going to be a good time. But it is so much more than that. It is the lives of people that are at stake here. And I just want to encourage you to jump on board with us and help us out. Thank you. Yes. It's great to see all of you here. Many of the faces I recognize, but there are some that I don't. But we're happy that you're here. I'm going to ask you right now just to take a minute to get up and greet several people around you and get some names.
Okay, let's find our places. October is Clergy Appreciation Month, and so I am really hoping that during the month of October, at least you'll think about saying something to Todd and Julie and Craig and Amy about how much you appreciate them. And, you know, saying it to their face is great. <laughs> Clapping for them is wonderful. But I would really encourage you to find a, an encouragement card on the table out here or just write one yourself at home and bring it next week, just telling them how grateful you are that they serve us as faithfully as they do. You also may want to take them out for a meal, or maybe take them to a post game. <laughs> he needs help with that because you'd have to take him to Chicago to the Bears if you got what he wanted. But no, just think about a Bills game. <clears throat> So October is Clergy Appreciation Month, and we are so very, very grateful for the pastors uh, that we have, Todd and Craig and their wives. A little over a month ago, uh, our granddaughter, Ashley, was here, and she works with YWAM, and she was about to leave for Amsterdam and then do a trek in the Himalayas. And I am really happy to give just a very brief report about that. Uh, could we have the pictures up right now, please? Chicago's too hot to put up. That's, this is Ashley in the front here. And then the team of girls are here as well. And this is some of the country they were trekking in. This is amazing. And now, here's a little video of a track. Isn't that something? Yes. <clears throat> Amazing. Something happened to Ashley the day before she was to begin this track. She was helping at the, at the headquarters in Amsterdam there and she fell off a ladder and she hurt her heel. And she didn't know if she'd be able to go. And so she called her mom and dad and said, what am I gonna do? And they gave her some advice. We were praying. And I must admit that I was saying, Ashley, if you are hurt bad, then don't go because you'll hold the team back. And, um, and so we were praying. And then our daughter called and said, <clears throat> Ashley's going. She said, if God wants me to go, he's gonna heal me. And she went bad. <laughs> And I just thought, wow, your face is better than mine. And so she's gone, and she's done a wonderful trek, had a great time with these ladies. Two or three of them are going to be staying up there and minister. <clears throat> what they brought to the people where they were ministering was not big Bibles, heavy Bibles like this, but they brought little electronic, you know, computer sticks with the Bible and devotional things on them. And so they could carry a lot more than if they had just uh, brought heavy paper Bibles like, like we normally think of. And I was also just thinking, you know, I think of people high in the mountains, they're probably primitive, they probably have barely electricity. <laughs> but these people have computers and uh, it's just amazing. And Ashley uh, texted this morning, she is, uh, uh, actually, now they have just taken off at 10 o'clock our time this morning, 
for Dubai and then tomorrow morning back to Amsterdam. And she said that she's going to send, she's waiting for a professional pictures and she's going to, those of you who have signed up to get her newsletter, you'll be getting pictures and uh, the letter and so you'll have an update really soon. So thank you so much for praying and for supporting Ashley. <clears throat> the Psalm I'd like to read this morning is Psalm 117 and then just a couple of verses of 18. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all you people of the earth. For he loves us with unfailing love. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Let the congregation of Israel repeat, His faithful love endures forever. Let the congregation of Lighthouse repeat, His faithful love endures forever. Once more, His faithful love endures forever. We know that the world is very troubled this morning, and so I'm just going to ask you to bow your head with me as I lead us in prayer. Father, we know that your faithful love endures forever, and we experience that in trials, in good times. Lord, we know that your faithful love endures forever and has carried us through. We're so grateful for that. And Father, this morning I want to pray especially for the people of Israel. As we watch events unfold in the news, we're at a loss for words. There's so much violence, so much hurting. You can't imagine what those in Israel and Palestine must be experiencing right now. I pray that you would protect them in the midst of this escalation of violence right now. Please shelter people from harm, get families to safety, and shield them with your peace and protection. God, although I don't know what will happen in Israel in the next few days, I do know that you have protected them in the past. You are the God of the nation of Israel. You have protected them throughout history, and you will continue. Lord, I pray that just as we have a, we anticipate experience your presence here this morning, they, in their much more frightening times, would experience your presence as well. Be among us this morning, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks so much, uh, Joey and Ray, for uh, causing us to look higher this morning as we enter into a time of, of worship and song. I'd like you to stand as we, as we do just that. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. 
some level of loss this week and I know some people have lost jobs and and so whether this the loss comes by means of preparation where, where we knew, kind of know this is coming for whatever reason of, of, of disease or causes that or there's um, tragedies that happen uh, I want to take a moment and just pray right the Bible says that God is the God of all comfort and, and just perhaps today that's what we need and so let me just pray for us. Heavenly Father, thanks so much um, for a powerful truth we can find in your word that you are the God of all comfort. And that we can know that truth, that we can know it to our very soul, in our hearts, and in our minds to be comforted in times of loss. And that God, we will here on this earth experience sorrow. We know a day that is coming that, that will no longer happen. There, there is a day, and I pray that you would bring our minds to that reality, that there's a day coming when no tear will be shed. That, um, Lord, there will be no more sorrow. But while we're here, it happens. And so I pray for the Van Heeren family and the Pellis family, Stapleton family and the Richet family in their loss this week and uh, in their grief. And that um, in, in some ways, Lord, that they've already felt your presence. I, I pray that it would be strong here this morning as their most family. And um, that we, uh, Lord, would, would be reminded of that we've been called to Rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And, uh, and so bring us to that place, I pray, as we care for one another. And I pray, Lord, that um, um, for those who are are suffering and struggling and, and feeling that weight of, of despair in some level or grief in some way, that, God, that you, you would be the peace in their life right now here in this moment that they would truly feel your hand on their shoulder um, and that they would tangibly know that the presence of the Almighty God is with them and caring for them. And so we just, uh, we bring this before you, Lord, knowing of your great love as we've echoed and prayed and declared this morning, you are and have a faithful love that endures forever. And uh, so may we stand on that truth this morning. Lord, thank you so much for that love all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to continue to pray for those families uh, as well this week. Um, we're going to be praying for, uh, so Brady, who does our sound stuff at the back, uh, he goes in for surgery during the operation on, th on Tuesday, leaves tomorrow. And so if, um, if you remember at the end of the service, we're just going to have a time of prayer around Brady here at the front. And so if you want to come and join us, that's, uh, I invite you to do so. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn with me to Acts chapter 14 is where we're going to be. If you're doing the math, you, you're, you know that we are now halfway through the book of Acts. And, and you're thinking, wow, halfway through. Haven't we been in Acts forever? Feels like that, but I think that's okay, right? <laughs> um, so we started this uh, series on May the 21st and celebrated Pentecost and, and read and um, all that comes with that on uh, uh, many, seems like many months ago. And so you can gauge then, right? So for about five and a half months into Acts, guess what? We've got five and a half more months coming. You know? And uh, yeah, it's been, so hopefully, I say all that to say, um, 
hopefully it's been fruitful for you. And I know that it has been for me. The title of today's sermon is A Tale of Two Cities. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe you're chuckling because you think of the book by Charles Dickens written in 1859. That's exactly what all of you are thinking right now. Oh, isn't that the historical fiction that was written in 1859? How clever, Mr. McGregor. And I appreciate those sentiments. <laughs> the book that uh, Charles Dickens wrote uh, that was set in London and Paris before the, and during the French Revolution. How many of you, just out of curiosity, have ever read that book? Okay, is it good? It's, a, it's all right. I have never read the book, and to be honest with you, I probably won't, uh, just by that reaction. That was a, you know, but, it, but it's a classic, so I think there's some part of it that you, that, you know, you, you have to read it. Did you read it in school? Was it in school? Yes. Okay. All right. And so that says a lot about what I remember about school again. Uh, man, if I had to do it all again, I'd go back and get an education. <laughs> but the opening paragraph of the book, perhaps you've heard part of it. Okay, it starts by saying this, it was the best of times, and it was the worst of, worst of times. Usually that's all we remember, but it goes on. It's interesting, listen. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, and it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the, listen, it was the season of light, and it was the season of darkness. <coughs> it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us and we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. It's an interesting opener. It's, it's a bit provocative. He kind of pits extremes against one another, right? It's the best of times. Definitely it's the worst of times. An interesting book. It's the season of light, the season of darkness, good or evil. And there doesn't seem to be, according to Dickens, anything in between. Now, I realize that this book is historical fiction, but is he wrong in his assessment? Good question. Halloween is just around the corner, right? And you would know so because it's decorating season. And uh, and so maybe you've got a house that's decorated fully when the uh, Halloween season comes, or you've got a neighbor who does so. And uh, uh, we have a neighbor right around the corner from our house that, that goes all out on the inflatables. And you really can't see grass anymore. We've just got all these really kind of scary uh, inflatables. And he's got this large black cat that when you walk by, the head will turn. And it scares... Um, my dog, not me, he scares my dog. Uh, he didn't scare me whatsoever. The first one? The first one. <laughs> but so, in, in, so in, 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 what Dickens is getting at being a season of light and a season of darkness, good or evil, is celebrating Halloween harmless. Or is there something more going on that we should be aware of and wary of? I want to let that hang for one moment. Because I realized just by saying that, I might have just divided the room. Right? It's one of those contentious questions that Christians have argued about and debated over years. Is Halloween something we should support or not? Is it good or is it evil? Or can we kind of sandwich it somewhere in between? It's a good question, isn't it? Well, I'm going to cop out and not answer that question. <laughs> but rather point you to the reality. Are things good or are things evil? Do you wrestle with that reality? Light and darkness, the reality of good and evil, anything supernatural in that, in that point. And saying that, I want to begin, before we get into God's word, I want to ask you a question before we dig into the text today, and it's just simply this. Do you believe God is speaking to you today? So we're talking about good, evil, supernatural. Do you believe that God is speaking to you? Do you come to church Knowing, believing, God will speak to you. Kind of a rhetorical question, but thank you for answering. <laughs> okay, so let's go. Acts 14, verse 1, and we're going to work our way through this, meaning I'm going to stop and, and explain as we go. So, Acts 14, beginning in verse 1, in our first city. In Iconium, they entered, this is Paul and Barnabas, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual. 
and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. And so they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided, and some siding with the Jews and others with, with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they fled about, they fled out about it and fled to the Laconian towns of Leicester and Derbe, to the surrounding countryside, and there they continued preaching the gospel. So let's pause right there. That's city number one, Iconium. Last week when we ended, we read about the time when Paul and Barnabas were in uh, a place called uh, Pisidian Antioch. And there's, there's a map, guys. Can you put the map up there? Maybe it can help give us a, a picture of kind of where we're at here. And so that red line shows their journey. Several weeks ago, they were on the island of Cyprus and preaching the gospel and, and faced a little bit of opposition in, in a false teacher. <coughs> then they landed in Pamphylia and Perga, and then they made their way in and up and around to the city of Antioch up there. That's where we spent the bulk of our time meeting last week. And, and whereas it says the whole town assembled to hear from them and to hear their teaching, to hear them talking about this man, Jesus, and that he is the, he is the Messiah, there was persecution that began. So it says that the end of chapter 13, the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and leading men of the city, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. In other words, get out. We don't want to hear anything more from you. And so they head northeast. And following the same strategy that they did when they landed on Cyprus and when they were in Pisidian Antioch, they hit the syn synagogues first. They preached what they knew to the people that they, familiar, they were familiar with. But where last week the whole town came to hear them was saying there was opposition that was present, but even, even that opposition was really the minority. But here in Iconium, we see things are starting to increase. And it says that the unbelieving Jews are now stirring up the Gentiles. Those who are hearing and believing or hearing and leaning in, those who are hearing and saying, Paul, tell us more. The unbelieving Jews are doing everything they can to poison the minds of everybody there. And as a result, the people were divided. Let's just say 50-50. Some are backing the unbelieving Jews and, and some are backing the apostles. <coughs> but Paul and Barnabas, resilient as they are, stayed there a long time, spoke boldly for the Lord, and the Lord worked through them his message of grace and to do the signs and wonders. But when Rumors started going, legitimate rumors, that they were, well, we're going to do a little bit more than kick you out of our town this time. We're going to stone you. Paul and Barnabas got wind of that and fled to Lystra and continued to preach the gospel, resilient as they are. That brings us to city number two, verse eight. In Lystra, a man was sitting who was without strength in his feet. He had never walked and had been lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke, and after looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet. And he jumped up, and he began to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted, saying in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus whose temple was just outside of the town, he brought bulls and wreaths to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. Okay, pause there for a minute because a, a bit of a backstory is required for us to understand exactly what's going on now because this is a response that we have not seen yet. We've either got people who hear the word of God that's hearing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, and they say, I believe, or we've got those who are like, no, get out of our town, but we don't have people who are like, oh, you must be other gods. Let's sacrifice to you. So in this particular town, many, many, many generations ago, they believe, it's one of those legend has it type stories, that Zeus and Hermes actually did come and visit this city in Lystra. They came in human form, visited this city, were rejected um, any hospitality by the town except for an elderly couple who cared for them out of their poverty. The gods rewarded them, but punished the town by destroying it with the flood. And so here they are, with that in the back of their minds, and they see Paul, right, as God does miracles and signs and wonders through them to, to cause a man to walk who's never walked before. 
So seeing that happen, but also seeing just how gifted Paul is at speaking in his message of, of this wonderful truth of finding forgiveness and life in this Jesus Christ, he must be a god. And so let's worship him because you know what? We're not gonna we're not gonna jeopardize or risk anything like that happening again as legend has it. And the apostle, verse 14, Paul and Barnabas tore their robes when they heard this, and they rushed into the crowd, shouting, People, why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you, and we are proclaiming good news to you that you turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way, although he did not leave himself without a witness, since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food and hearts with joy. In, in Iconium, as they're going to synagogues, and to people they're familiar with, they came with the scriptures, because they knew the scriptures. But here in Leicester, he doesn't, because they don't know the scriptures. And so he connects with them, finds the common ground that's common to every single person, and that is the natural world around them. A world that they can, they can see, a world that they know, and he begged them to turn from worshipping these idols to the true, to the living God. And he spoke of God in that way. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, the sea, everything in them. At this point in time, you can't help but maybe enter into this kind of picture. He's trying to stop people from sacrificing animals to them. Let me try to wrap your head around that picture. And telling them that this God is, is real and alive and, and maybe gesturing with his hands, see, like this mountain range that's before you. God created that. And, and the sea that's just beyond the mountain range, God created that. Moreover, God, who made all things, listen, has not been inactive, he says. But on the contrary, God has borne a constant and consistent witness to himself by his kindness to all mankind. I don't care what Bible you have, you need to understand. If you're, if you're using one of our Bibles, still underline it, still highlight that, that passage. Because listen... There's a question you may be asked at one point in time, and I know as a pastor and as a youth pastor, and I know Craig faces this as well, um, that everybody wants to know. And as soon as I say it, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If God is so loving, how, why would he let bad things happen to good people? Right? So listen, Paul just answered that question. Because we can answer that question. I mean, Paul does say uh, elsewhere in the book of Romans, he says that no one seeks God and no one's good. So when we sit there and say, how can bad things happen to good people? We can say, well, there's no such thing as good people. But if that question is being asked in integrity, let's, let's do a really good job of answering it. And Paul says, God has never left himself without witness. So you're just saying, look, these bad things that are happening to his life. But the good question you should be asking is, why does God let good things happen to bad people? Right? Isn't that, like, isn't that the better way to, to ask that question? Because maybe we're as speechless in answering that question as we are in the other one. But God, God has borne a consistent witness to himself, listen, by his kindness to every single person. God is kind to everyone, Paul says, including his listeners here. He's given them rain from heaven for their crops on the earth in their seasons, and he has provided them with food for their bodies, therefore filling their hearts with joy. Even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing. <coughs> Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples gathered around him, he got up, as resilient as he is, and he went back into the town. <coughs> the next day, he left with Barnabas for Derbe. So city number two, things just seem to be going from bad to worse. They continue to preach the gospel, and God continues to work in signs and wonders, right? The miracles that accompany the message, the miracles that authenticate the message, the miracles that God is saying, listen to these men and listen to what they're saying. 
But whereas the response, as I said, was people coming to faith, now we're seeing a bit of an opposite response of not believing. As a matter of fact, the opposing forces, if you are tracking with us, and you can probably follow that red line back on the map, is that, is that those from Pisidian Antioch who told Paul and Barnabas, get out of our town, get out of our region, we don't want to hear from you anymore, they couldn't let that go. And so they followed them to Iconium and stirred up those who were unbelieving there, right? The 50% who did not believe and, and whose minds were poisoned. And so together, this mob kind of grew from Pisidian Antioch to Iconium and now have landed in Lystra. And now they've, they've banded together and they just grabbed Paul and said, enough of you. Fanning you doesn't work. Telling you to shut up doesn't work. Actually, this is one your thing. Like, Paul just drives people nuts. Listen, if you want to drive people nuts, just continue to praise God. Because we're going to read in a few chapters in Acts 16 where they put him in jail, right? We're going to shut, we're going to shut you up somehow. We're going to throw you in jail. And he just worships God loudly. Like, all right, fine, get out of jail. And he just goes out and preaches the word, right? Paul's got to drive all the authorities nuts. And so they just figure, let's just shut him up permanently and let's just kill him. And so in winning over the crowds and poisoning their minds, they stone Paul and they drag him out of the city because they thought, listen, he was dead. By everything they saw, he's no longer alive. So let's drag him outside of the town and leave him for the aliens. That's how badly beaten he was. And so persecution follows Paul and Barnabas, and in fact, it increases. Why? Like, why are these guys so angry? What caused somebody to stir up in them anger so deep, so prevalent, so has to be reconciled, has to be expressed, has to be taken out on people, that they, they would travel hundreds of miles to get at Paul and shut him up. Just because he's preaching that Jesus is the Messiah. Just preaching. We were talking earlier this morning. He's just preaching a message of love. Love one another. Love your enemies. Well, to, or, to an Orthodox Jew, this would have been blasphemy. But really, who cares? Like way back in Acts chapter 5, one of the, the leaders, Gamaliel, has the apostles before them, and, and, and you know, they've been preaching the good news, and he says, hey, look, if this movement is legit, there's nothing we can do about it, but if it's just people, we're just let them go. So why, can, why doesn't it happen in Antioch or, or, or Iconium or Lystra? Like, really, who cares? Let's just let them preach this nonsense and move on. It's because they can't. They can't because there's more to it than that. And so this tale of two cities is really a tale of two kingdoms. A tale of two kingdoms. When Jesus began his public ministry, if we were to go back to Mark chapter 1, it says that he went to Galilee, he was proclaiming the good news of God. He said, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. So something new is happening. The kingdom of God, and if everybody then looked up, he's like, no, 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 it's here. How do we enter this kingdom, Jesus? Repent and believe in the good news. This is how Jesus began his ministry. The kingdom of God has now come near. You heard of the kingdom of God to those he was speaking to at the time. And if it did cause you to look up, he said, no, 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 no. No, look at me. Because the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. And Paul reiterates this. I mean, there's so many verses I could, could bring up that refer, reference the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the Son or the kingdom of heaven. Colossians 1. Paul sheds some interesting light on that reality. And he says, God, he has rescued us, those who repent and believe in jesus he's rescued us from listen the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves <coughs> two kingdoms so dickens was right it's the season of light and it's the season of, of darkness the apostle paul in ephesians chapter 6 he said here's our struggle so if we think in the context of what we just read in acts 14 paul is right I mean, that's a struggle. Facing persecution that seems to always now increase. He says, this is our struggle. It's not against flesh and blood. Which is a kind of interesting thing for, for Paul to say. Because like there were men throwing rocks at him. 
That's flesh and blood. But just as I said that there's more to it, this is the more to it that Paul's talking about. He said our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the rulers and against the authorities and against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil spiritual forces in the heavens. That's our struggle. Listen to how Jesus talks about evil and talks about Satan. John chapter 8, Jesus says, If God were with you, this is speaking to actually the unbelieving Jewish leaders. If God were your father, you would love me because I came from God and I am here. For I didn't come on my own, but he sent me. Why don't you understand what I say? Because you cannot listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Remember that. Because there is no truth in him. And when he tells a lie, he speaks from his own nature. Because he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe in me. So that's, the, that's real. So he's talking about Satan. And being the father of all lies. Being behind the struggle that is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers of darkness. How could somebody travel from, from Antioch being so mad and so angry and then gather forces in Iconium and then, and then gather more forces and then seek out Paul to stone? How could somebody be that angry? Because there's the cosmic powers of this darkness behind it. And I think we saw that very same thing last Saturday. If you're following the events that are happening in the world, the Ray talked about a little bit earlier in Israel and that last Saturday, Hamas violently attacked Israel, killing, maiming, and kidnapping women and children in horrific ways that I will not mention here this morning. And perhaps if you know very little about it, the one question you want to know is how, right? How could somebody do what they are doing? And you can Google that, and you'll get a, a list of reasons why Israel's kind of pressing too close to their borders, or they're cutting off the underground tunnels, and, and they're upset, and they're firing back. But in every single article, you will find this. So this is a quote from CBS News. Hamas has said that it's motivated to launch the attack essentially as the culmination of long-building anger. Cosmic powers of darkness and evil working in the world. I'm reminded of this, and I thank Ray for bringing us an update about Ashley, and, and um, we kind of gasp and, and, and are just kind of overwhelmed by what missionaries do, right? Whenever we talk about missionaries, we see just this trek through the Himalayas. And, um, it's interesting, Ray and I met this week and talking about that there's, there's parts of Ashley's story I can't tell you. And that he can't mention. I'm like, look, we, we talk about where she's going and trekking through the Himalayas and leaving with who, but we can't tell you where she's going because then her life is in danger. Because opposition to the kingdom of God is real. And she is in it. And so I, I wanted to take part of my week this week and spend some time uh, just connecting with our missionaries that we, that we support uh, here. And so uh, I want to do two things at once in, in, in and through them. Just describe to you the oppositions that they face. The cosmic powers of darkness in in the people that we're helping, opposing the people we're helping. Vince Vetro is one of our uh, missionaries. He leads an organization called the Lending Journey, and so they do missionary work in Nicaragua and uh, providing uh, micro loans to people. The problem in Nicaragua, we talk about opposing forces and where they find corruption and struggle, is simply that in Nicaragua you have very rich people and you have very poor people. That's it. There is no middle class. And so you have a very corrupt government who structures this thing this way. And so the lifeline in those small villages and even the big places is the church. And so the lending journey goes down and through micro loans and helping people provide for their needs and start small businesses, they also, as a prerequisite, are planting churches. And then they, they um, you have to do 26 weeks of a Bible study class in, in your loan repayment period. And so we'll give you the money that you need to start up this business, 
But a condition of that is that you would you would basically come and join this church, or, you, or we would work with you to plant a church. <laughs> you want money? Well, you got to come to Bible class. And yeah, it's been it's fantastic. Um, I, I want to share with you a, a, a really really cool story really quickly. Um, he, he talked, uh, Vince shared with me a story about uh, a pastor down there who uh, um, his name's Pastor Osmani. Uh, years ago, because of this corruption, because of the government. Forced them to move outside of Nicaragua to a very small shanty town called San Benito. And um, started a church there, put in a well, um, because the government charges for water. And so they've actually charged, they actually uh, created a well where people can come get water for free. So in this village, um, and working alongside Pastor Osmani, they reach people with the gospel and they provide financial aid at the same time. So... They're feeding stomachs and feeding souls at the same time. It's really, really wonderful. But many years ago, they, they uh, lent him money to start a, um, I'm going to write here, bee honey business to support himself and his family and the people of this small, small village. And over the course of many years uh, and many other loans, he's gone from three hive boxes to 31 hive boxes. But he reached this kind of stage where um, he was kind of at, a, at an impasse. He, he needed to... He needed to better the production in order to feed the people in the town and care for the people in the town. And so he pulled Vince aside and he said, here's what I need. I'm in a bit of a tough spot. There's a piece of machinery that we need to buy and here's how much it costs because that would greatly reduce the workload of purifying the honey and it would save us countless hours and lots of money so we can help provide in and through our church in San Benito. So to make a long story short, it was at this time that Lifehouse sent them a check for $1,000, which was the exact amount they needed to buy this machinery. So think about how crazy that is right now. Okay, so we're, we're just in an elders meeting, and we're saying, hey, we've got this, we've got this money, let's, let's give. So, you know, we want to give to Seven Arts of Life, and we want to give to the Dream Center, and we want to give to Matthew House, and, and we want to give to our, our general fund when it comes to our, the missions things, we want to give to our other missionaries. Well, let's send Vince $1,000. And so to think that far away from us, the kingdom of God flourishes through us, through God's generosity, and then through you as you give to Lifehouse, and then we give to these organizations. And then we can have stories like this that said, if it wasn't for Lifehouse, I wouldn't have this. And it wasn't, and we're saying, well, if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't have money to give. And we see this pushback against the, the cosmic powers of darkness and what they're trying to do in their hatred and disregard for human life and the corrupt governments in various parts of the world to ostracize in poverty these people and we get to help. That's amazing. So I was reminded of the ongoing challenge, not of just present demonic activity, but even through political corruption and corrupt governments and the poverty that results in it, the kingdom of God pushes back against the kingdom of darkness. I spoke with Danny and Vera Karangi just through email this week. Uh, if you remember, if you've been with us for the last number of years, they were with us here in this place in March of 2022. And, and so they serve God faithfully in Serbia. Actually, they are they're here. Uh, they're in Niagara Falls, actually, this morning. Uh, but heading back to Serbia for two more years and to serve and to start um, churches in and through their ministry of caring for people who are addicted to drugs, alcohol, addiction services. Because... After decades of communism, followed by civil war, their economy is in shambles. And as a result, there's a huge drug problem in Serbia. And so that is the focus of their ministry. And so when I asked them, what oppositions do you face? Their response was simply this. We had and we continue to have many oppositions. <coughs> Just present, in our face, all the time. And then Vera said this. The enemy hates what we do, that we serve Christ, and he wants us to be discouraged and defeated. There's another a man that we support, his name's Adam, Adam Dewick, and I can give you no report. Because if I say anything about what he's doing, or where he's serving, and who he's ministering to, his life is in danger. <laughs> this is crazy. So both... Ashley, we can't say exactly what she's doing. I'm recording this, right? We, we can't say exactly what she's doing because of her life's in danger. And Adam, we can't say what he's doing because his life's in danger. The opposition is so 
prominent and prevalent that we can't even talk about it here if we're recording it. But we can pray. This week I've been studying the realities of the kingdom of darkness, the domain of darkness and the kingdom of God in my course that I'm taking. And I had to watch a video by a man by the name of David Witt, who is a missions representative with Voice of the Martyrs. Have anybody heard of that organization? And in the seminar that, sorry, in the seminar that I watched, he was just updating about all the missionaries all over the world, and specifically, he showed a video of a missionary to India and showed him being violently attacked by the people of a small village because he was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like, we don't get it, right? We, we, we can't tangibly understand what they're going through, and it was so hard to watch. But the influ influences that are abroad, and in, in, in that's in Nicaragua or Serbia or, or these other places that our missionaries are serving in, but the influences that are there are here. Like Paul makes it clear in, in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air. Jesus already told us about him. And the spirit that is now working in the disobedient, and we too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires. The world, the devil, and the flesh. Cosmic powers of darkness working in and through these things. So, so we know evil exists. Okay, are you getting that so far? We've seen it in Acts 14. We can talk about it in globally. You know, we can talk about it personally. We know that evil exists. The Bible says so. We know that evil exists because the news says so. And we know that evil exists because our human experience says so. That evil is here. The kingdom in course, sorry, the, the cosmic forces of darkness are at work in the world whether it is in present day ideologies all the way to the entertainment that we'll watch later today. So what? If that's a reality, what next? How did Paul respond? You'll notice that throughout the message so far I've used a word to kind of describe Paul's actions and that word is resilient. That when an attempt was made by both Jews and Gentiles with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they, they, they fled, which is perfectly fine, right? Danger's coming. Doesn't make me more of a Christian to stand and take it. No. They flee to the surrounding countryside, but they continued. They continued to preach the gospel. And when they're tracked down by those same Jews from Antioch and Iconium, and they went over the crowd, they stoned Paul, they dragged him outside of the city thinking he was dead. The disciples gathered around him and he got up and went into the town. And the next day he left with Barnabas for Durban. What we need is that kind of resilience, isn't it? What we need is that kind of, of resilience. We need gospel-centered resilience. We need gospel-centered resilience. 11.30. Listen, I could speak for probably another 25 or 30 minutes. Go for it. Because I've had, there is, I've got sub points for you to write here. But they're sub, they're sub points. And they're, they're important. They're just not as important. Like they didn't make the PowerPoint. They didn't make the cut. But I want you to write them down because it's important. But what we see in Acts 14, what we know it's true throughout all the New Testament, is number one, write this down. Community matters. Community matters. Well, not alone. He's with Barnabas, and they're, they're, they're out together. They, as a community, were sent out as a smaller community to minister to other communities, and that community grows. Next week, we're talking about church planting, and we're talking about the importance of community, building gospel-centered community. The community matters. And in this picture, I don't know about you, but this is just an amazing picture in verse 20 of chapter 14. And after the disciples gathered around him, what were they doing? We don't know. We don't know. We just know that they were there. We just know that they were there. Were they praying? Laying hands on them? Helping them get up? Yes. Perhaps. But they were there. And I think in our culture in today, we've got to fight against isolation. And we need to fight against individualism. That I'm, I'm good. I, I don't need you. And that's not true. The other thing, and this might sound comical, I don't know, don't, less, don't let past 
hurts slow present condition. Don't let past hurts slow present. And why I say it's comical is that he was just stoned to death, and then he gets up and he goes back into the same town. I don't know about you, but I can't stop and go. How in the world did you do that? Like kind of like to just go. You know what? Let's go someplace else. He got back up and he went into the same town that stoned him to, to when he was almost dead. So listen, if we cheat a little bit and we kind of kind of creep into next week's text, this is what it says. After they preached the gospel in that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch, strengthening the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith by telling them it is necessary to go through many hardships to enter the kingdom. The past hurts are the many hardships that we're going to go that God uses Right? Hardships and struggle and strife to mold us and shape us, sanctify us. They're necessary, friends. And so we need to fight bitterness of past hurts. We need to fight resentment from past hurts. And if we're to be honest, we need to stop complaining about past hurts because they will slow our present ambitions if we do not keep our eyes on Christ. Look at this reality. Listen. Geographically speaking, Derbe is 60 miles south of Lystra and Iconium. 60 miles. So it says, the next day, so he's stoned, he's brought outside of the city, he's half dead, he gets up, he goes into town, and the next day he walks 60 miles. If I work out this afternoon, I'm done for the next two days. <laughs> right? I can't do anything. <laughs> lift, lift, I can't lift. Right? Almost dead and yet walks 60 miles. And the reason why these two are subpoints, the community matters, not letting past hurts, slow present ambitions, because I don't want you to lose sight of the main point this morning. Because we can say community matters, and so I'm gonna start new habits, and I'm gonna start meeting with people more and being honest with people and start being more transparent, and I'm gonna swear today that I'm not gonna complain anymore or be bitter or resent what's happened in my past and how people have hurt me. Maybe even people are from the communities I've been a part of before in the past and past churches and, and all these things, and all these ways that I can hurt, I'm going to resolve both community issues and my past issues. I'm going to do this today, and therefore I'm going to be resilient. And the main point you need to take away from today is you can't do it. It's impossible. You cannot white knuckle this kind of resilience. You can't. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, for this reason, take up the full armor of God that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything to take your stand, the evil day. One chapter previously, Paul says to be careful in how we're living our lives to be wise people, but he says, make the most of your time because the days are evil. So Paul said, we're, we're living in, in, in these evil days. But in chapter 6, he says, we need to be wearing the full armor of God. So we prepare for the evil day. What he means is this, and I don't mean to scare you, is that there is an evil day coming. Listen, Look right at me. That has nothing to do with the end times and nothing to do with the return of Christ. It means that there may be a day, a day that is far worse than anything else you've ever experienced. Completely out of your control and it is the work of the devil in the world in your life. Paul says yeah. that day is coming for everyone. On not the same day, it could be a different day. But we're not left. We're not left with, like, like, how am I going to get through the evil day? Because that sounds scary. Paul uses this word, stand. And whenever you see a word repeated in Scripture, always take note of why it is there. He says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For this reason, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day, having prepared everything to take your stand. And in verse 14 of chapter 6 in the book of Ephesians, Paul says, stand therefore. 
with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for all the saints. Paul, what do we do? And he says, do this. Take your stand. It's the precursor to everything else he says in Ephesians 6. Take your stand clothed with the armor of God. And if you'll notice, every single thing he talks about, the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the, the good news of peace and peace and shield of faith and the helmet of salvation run completely opposite to the devil and the cosmic powers of the darkness. The devil is the father of lies and put on the belt of truth. Satan's going to come at you. He's going to come at your heart. He's going to come at your mind with accusations and charges. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. Be clothed, clothed with understanding the reality of imputed righteousness in Christ. That you are holy because Christ is wrapped around you. If you have repented and believed in him. Which guards our hearts. That breastplate of righteousness. That we would go with the message of the gospel. It's essential in, 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 in we see in Paul's ministry, we see in the, the whole ministry and life of the church, the essential the, uh, of, of having the gospel, but being ready to share the gospel, being prepared to share the gospel as we advance into Satan's territory. The shield of faith extinguishes all of his darts if we would believe. And the helmet of salvation, as I said, protects our minds. We will not receive any false doctrine and give way to Satan's temptations. And we hold fast. Everything's on kind of defensive. We've got all these, these, these bits and pieces of armor that we would put on for our defense. But he says, no, 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 wait a second. Wait a minute. Hold fast to the word of God. Hold fast to the Bible. Because there is no greater spiritual weapon, friends. Jesus used it himself against the devil in the desert. And the word of God is always our overpowering response the works of Satan. And lastly, pray at all times. We talked about this several weeks ago. What it means to be a praying church. There's power in prayer to pray expectantly. And in his prayer, Paul is praying for something that we need. In Ephesians chapter 3, he says, he says, for this reason, I, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, and I pray that he might grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power in your inner being through the Spirit. So if, if you're asking, how in the world can I sin? How in the world can I stand when I have been knocked down by life, when I've come face to face with the evil day? And I've been knocked out. How in that moment can I sin? Then we need to be reminded that something outside of ourselves must give us that strength. That's why Paul prays that we would be strengthened with power in your inner being through his spirit. See, again, it's not us white knuckles. Oh, yeah, God, I can do this. No, you can't. God can Paul begins his exhortation of the armor of God by saying, be strengthened by the Lord and by his back strength. And friends, this can and will happen. There's a proverb my wife always reminds me of. And that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So let us seek, I believe, with missionary mindsets, the strength that can be only found in the Lord, and that we would be resilient, gospel-centered resilience is what we need. Something that we can't do ourselves, it has to come through Jesus Christ, by his Holy Spirit. And that we would go and we would proclaim, and we would talk about Jesus, and we would tell people the good news of Jesus, because 
because he's worth it. That's why Paul is so real in this moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us again this morning through your word. And I pray that Lord, in all that we have heard and all that we have uh, taken in, in in this truth this morning, that we would be um, equipped. Meaning, Lord, I pray that it would stick. I pray that, that, that to be reminded that, that the, yes, that there is a kingdom of darkness that really exists. And that there is a cosmic power of darkness at work in the world that we live in. Is, um, but we let's stand on the truth, Lord, that we've heard from you today. And be obedient and to put on the armor that you've given us. And that is truth, righteousness, and holiness, and faith. And then, God, that you would make us, by your strength, resilient people. I pray all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. 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 I want to invite Noel to come and give us our benediction for today. I want to invite you to stand as we go out. Can we turn on mic number 15, please? today, I want to read from uh, Jude verses 24 to 25. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.